Hey guys, I know we're live, hey. but, <laughs> but uh, they'll they'll edit us out of this. Um, so, <laughs> the um, would you like uh, Tim? I know you said to alternate. I can do something where your you guys are just up here on the side. Would you just like for me to leave you both up on the side, and then you can just alternate? Sure. Yeah. yeah and what's it look like for you? Or I'll share mine as well. Um, that's Andreas's screen. You've got, I guess. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Um, can, can you, Eddie? Can you switch which screens are are visible? Yeah. So that's actually that's Tim's. That's yours. I can't exactly. tell. Exactly. Yeah. So I can. So I just alternate when Tim talks. I'll just hit the uh, the one beside you, Tim. Yeah, great. So that's, I'll that's perfect. We, we have the same layout and we also should switch slides forward at the same time. So users should not notice too much of the switching. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it'll be fine. You know, um, just if you need to go back or anything um, or just say, Eddie, switch back, I'll, I'll switch back. And cool. um, hopefully I'll keep it straight here. And then thank goodness for Angelus. Angelus has been taking the uh, venueless questions and pasting them into the ban to a banner so okay. we can, um, you know. Uh, cool. So, will, we, will we see that in this like? Uh, yeah, so you can see the open layers feature frenzy there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so when the questions come up, I'll try and put them into the oh, chat great. down below. So you just, you can see them ahead of time and read them. Nice. Angelus, I can't thank you enough. That is so helpful. It's just amazing. Um, okay, well, we'll be on in a couple of minutes here. It's uh, great that you guys were able to get together in Iceland and work this oh, yeah. out. You know. <laughs> Saves a little time zone problem. Yeah, you know, I think it might have been the first conference, actually, that it was done before the day of. <laughs> I don't know how it was for you, Andreas, but same. it, Absolutely. it was sort of nice, actually, to be done with the talk. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is quite amazing. You're you're right. Well, you know, there's we did the rehearsal our rehearsal so early, and then I I should have figured I didn't figure out the way these banners worked and the like. Angelos was using the there. That's really been helpful so much. So okay, well we'll be on in about see the upper left there. We really we should try and stop at you know um, where it says uh, twenty after. If, it, if you can it also move you know along we really we really do need to stop around 25 after with the q and a i am in a minute longer or we can go whatever but you know they're they're trying to keep it you know fairly constrained there so we can move on All right. to the next session okay and um i'll just do a quick intro to you both and then we'll um you know we'll just uh uh go on from there and Eddie, I assume everybody can hear us anytime we're unmuted. That's right. Okay. That's right. You you can control your own mute there with the, you know, just the mute or even stop your cam if you want. All right, we're on. Okay, everybody. We are uh, very fortunate to have Andreas Hochevar and Tim Schaub to present Open Layers Feature Frenzy. Um, many of you have seen both. They've been, been very active at Phosphor G for years. Open, uh, Andreas is a well-known open source developer, active steering committee member and committer for open layers, been in geospatial for more than 25 years and is co-founder of the Austrian company W3GO, runs his own small business and is a frequent teacher and speaker. And Tim's been working with the open source geospatial community for 20 something years as well, contributing to geostandards like GeoJSON, OGC uh, standardization efforts, and particularly in open layers. And in his time at OpenGeo, Boundless and Planet, Labs, Tim's worked on a variety of map related projects for open source. So I'm going to turn it over to them to go through open layers feature frenzy. Great. Thanks, Eddie. And um, thank you for the introductions. I think you may be showing uh, Andreas's slide. So, or maybe it's me already. Um, well, Eddie has already introduced um, the two of us. So uh, I'll just say again, I'm Tim and Andreas is here. For me, as well. it's enough to say hi at this point. Thanks, Eddie, for the great introduction. And I'm glad we can present here at Phosphor G. Hi, everybody. So we'll be switching back and forth as we go through our slides here. Uh, for people that are new to Open Layers, welcome. And um, if you haven't tried it out yet, Open Layers is available as a node packaged module. So 
if you have Node installed, you can start out by just running npm install ol. Um, today's talk is going to be a mix of some new features in the library you may not have heard about. Um, also, kind of a tour of some greatest hits sprinkled in with uh, some experimental and upcoming features that we're excited to introduce you to. So let's get right to it. We're going to be jumping around kind of quickly, showing live demos, hoping that everything goes smoothly. And um, I'm sure you'll bear with us if it doesn't. So the first thing I want to start out with is, is one of these greatest hits. This isn't a new feature, but you may not know mm -hmm. that it's possible to animate views and open layers. The view is where we store information about the uh, map center rot rotation and zoom level. And you can animate those things in your application if you want to take people on a tour uh, of different waypoints throughout a map. The thing I want to highlight here I'll get to after showing the demo, um, and I'll just give you a hint. If you look at this, you may see that it, uh, it's a little bit different than what you might be doing currently in your animations. Uh, animations can also be chained, so you can provide a series of, of locations or waypoints along the animation. And then at the end of that chain, you'll get called back so you can do something uh, like start a new animation or, or handle the end of that animation however you like. So we're going to start out here looking at one of these animations. Uh, we're zoomed into Minneapolis, um, the site of the 2005 Phosphor G conference. And then this is just a tour of all the, the conference locations since then. A few things I want to point out while this is going on. I'm not sure what the refresh rate is like for everybody. But in Open Layers, we try really hard to never show you off the edge of the world or show you off the edge of the tiles. So we don't want to show you white or blank space on the map. Um, so we're always loading tiles, and this is a configurable setting where you can say how many tiles zoom levels above the current level you want to preload. Uh, in this example, we're also taking advantage of a new feature. This is the WebGL tile layer renderer. And in that renderer, we prioritize the zoom level and location at the, of the end of the animation. So each one of these is an animation sequence. And if you look closely, you can see that the destination tiles are already loaded, or they're already queued up at least, and ready to be displayed uh, before we even get to that final location. So the idea is to finish loading where the, you want to draw the user's attention in these animations. So we've ended up here in Buenos Aires. Uh, wish we could all be here together right now. The thing I want to point out to you is this: uh, the geographic location that's been shown throughout here. and. This is the new feature um, that's been around for a little bit in the library and a few releases. It's still experimental, but you can try it out in your applications. If you import this use geographic function from this OLProj module and call use geographic, then the whole public facing API turns into an interface that works with geographic coordinates. Uh, this may seem expected to people who are new to the library, but for people who have used the library for a long time, you'll know that for example, when you're interacting with the view, you have to use the view projection. So everything we just saw, saw was in a web mercator projection. And typically, you'd have to set the center in those web mercator coordinates. But now you can use geographic coordinates, um, which we think is a lot friendlier. So for a bit more on projections and reprojection, I'll turn it over to Andreas. One of the greatest hits also in open layers is uh, reprojection, uh, straightforward for vector layers. If you have a view configured in a custom projection and load data from a vector data source like GeoJSON, you don't have to do anything in addition. Your data gets converted into the views projection and the vector data will align with any other layer you have on the map with the same view. The same works for raster too, and that's actually what makes this uh, one of the greatest hits. Um, same thing for the view, you give it a custom projection. If your, vector, if your raster source is in a different projection, in this case, a standard XYZ source, think of something like uh, OSM data in the web mercator projection, and the view will be in whatever projection you have configured as your custom projection. This is uh, a way to look at the map that we are familiar with in Web Mercator. Uh, we know one of the shortcomings of this projection is that uh, the further you get away from the equator, 
the bigger uh, the features on the map get. So Greenland here is almost bigger than Africa, which is it is not, of course. And now if we switch to a more suitable projection, this gets reprojected in the browser on the fly to, in this case, the UTM zone 22 uh, projection. If we zoom here a bit uh, closer in to the capital of Greenland, um, these differences, of course, are not as pronounced as when we look at the whole world. But also this here works on the fly. And now I'm switching back and forth between the two projections. Now, back to Tim for a little bit from the bucket of new stuff. All right. Yeah, so brand new in uh, the 6.7 release, we've added support for rendering GeoTIFFs. So the new GeoTIFF source lets you interact with remotely hosted uh, imagery in either cloud optimized GeoTIFF or just normal GeoTIFF uh, forms, but we encourage everybody to use the cloud optimized uh, format. And uh, here's an example of what it might look like if you were pointing to just a true color uh, world, that TIF. Uh, typically you might have um, images that represent different bands. So here I've got something that might be a sentinel image, near infrared, uh, and red and green bands. And then I would put them into these three different display channels, the red, green, and blue, and put that in a tile layer. And then I can view it on a map um, just like I do any other tile layer. So this is imagery from a single GeoTIFF here in Buenos Aires. And um, I can zoom in and view higher zoom levels. And then I can switch between these different visualizations. So now it went out and got the near infrared uh, red and green bands and uh, displayed those in this false color composite. One of the nice features about this, I'll, I just loaded up this image from Minneapolis and we'll zoom in and look at that uh, false color composite as well. Another new feature um, that's exposed on these GeoTIFF layers is that you can configure your view based on the properties in the, the GeoTIFF headers. So GeoTIFFs can have information about their projection and the extent in the projected coordinate system. And the new feature in open layers is that you can now uh, configure your map to say that you want your view properties to come from the source. So this saves you from having to look that up via other means um, or hard code that information into your application. Instead, you can just say you want the view to, to come from the source. So that's an exciting new feature. And um, for more cool features, we'll go back to Andreas. Thank you, Tim. Um, especially with the introduction of vector tiles, which we're going to talk a bit more about uh, just in a couple of minutes. Um, it's always good to be able to interact with vector data on the map. Um, typically, you do this uh, in conjunction with uh, an event. Uh, for example, if you click on the map, but uh, if you want to give uh, fast feedback to the user, you could also on a desktop device do this on pointer move, which is when you hover the, the mouse over something. And with this get features method on the layer, this is the fastest way that we provide so you can show properties in a side pane of your view as the user hovers over the map. Or you could just do something simple like change the cursor of the map to give the user a hint that they can select something. And for selection, if you've been around with open layers for a while, you may be familiar with the select interaction. I personally never use that. Uh, and especially with vector tile layers, it may also not be the tool of choice. Uh, you can have polygons that are uh, uh, split at tile borders. So one polygon can co uh, cover several tiles. And in this case, you need a different means of uh, coloring the feature by not just taking the one you got on one tile. In this case, we're using the feature ID to select everything that has the same ID. Uh, the way I do this, I create another vector tile layer, give it the same source as the original vector tile layer. In this case, I call this layer selection. And then again, I use this get features function that I just showed on the previous slide and uh, gets the IDs of the selected features. And then 
for the selected features, I set a style that when the uh, selected features include the feature that I'm currently rendering, I use the select style. And otherwise, I don't use a style at all, which means no features except for those that are selected will be rendered on this additional selection layer. And this gives you a nice feedback on mouse over. I'm showing this in action here with a layer, which is the soil map of Austria. Uh, on the top right, um, if the Phosphor G logo could be uh, removed just for a couple of seconds, you could see the type of soil that we have here. And as I hover over the map, uh, you can see the multi polygons and most of them uh, are scattered across several tiles. And you can, can see that I get immediate feedback on where I am with my mouse cursor. That's uh, one uh, puzzle piece of, for vector tiles. And now back to Tim for a bit more on vector features. All right. So back in the category of greatest hits, um, it was about 14 years ago that we added uh, vector support, vector rendering support, and tools that let you do things like edit uh, your features on a map. Uh, in recent Open Layers releases, the draw, modify, and snap interactions are the way that you can enable editing of vector features on your map. And if you haven't used those, they're, they're easy to configure. In this case, I've got a vector source, and I'm, I say that I want to allow drawing of polygons on that vector source. The modify interaction is configured in the same way. If you want to allow modification of that same source, add the modify interaction configured with that source. And finally, if you want to allow snapping uh, of features within a source, configure the snap interaction with that same source. So here's an example of uh, neighborhoods um, in Buenos Aires, and I'm using the draw interaction to create a new neighborhood. The modify interaction lets you add vertices or move existing vertices. Um, the snap interaction will engage with uh, features that are already on that source. So here, I, as I go, move close to an existing feature, the uh, cursor is encouraging me to snap to uh, that same location, and I can continue. Um, to add new features. And when I modify uh, a vertex, if there are several vertices that share the same location, the modify interaction will, will uh, edit all of those together at the same time. So now for a different flavor of vector data, we'll go back to Andreas um, to talk about vector tiles. Thanks, Tim. Uh, the previous presentation uh, had a question uh, how Mapbox styles can be translated into open layer style functions. Um, open layers can do that out of the box uh, with a separate library or Mapbox style that's used here under the hood. And the easiest way to get a Mapbox vector layer uh, with this is, which always comes with the data and the style rendered is by just pointing the new Mapbox vector layer, layer to a style URL, which is the style document. Um, to make uh, vector tile layers look nice, uh, we have added uh, decluttering for labels and symbols a while ago already. That's a feature that can also be used on vector layers. And also when we started supporting vector tile layers, we implemented a rendering of labels along lines, which is useful for labeling streets, for example. Uh, just so you know that uh, Mapbox style documents not only describe vector layers, but uh, describe a whole map. And if you want to build a map from a Mapbox style document, you can use this OL Mapbox style library directly. And with a single function call, you get a whole map with everything that's described in this whole style document. Let's look at a vector tile map of Buenos Aires here. Um, I want to draw your attention to the street labels here. As I rotate the map, um, they, uh, there's always made sure that they are upright so they stay readable. That's one of the advantages of vector tile maps. And also if I turn off decluttering here, you can see how nice it is that we have decluttering. I could also, edit this style now in a graphical style editor like uh, Maputnik. That's one of these style editors. Mapbox Studio um, is the one with the uh, biggest variety of features. 
but also with Maputnik, you can graphically edit styles, or you could also open another style. It's dark here in Graz, where I'm presenting from. So we could export a darker style here. I'm still in the uh, Maputnik editor here. And now I can take this style that I have just created and drag it onto my map. And the map gets immediately rendered with the uh, new darker style that I have here. Tim is going to show more about tiles, but in a completely different way right now. All right. Uh, so among the new features, and this one is still marked as experimental, is support for the OGC API tiles specification. Uh, it's marked as experimental in the library because the, the spec is not yet finalized. So once that spec is finalized, this will be part of our stable API. But you can start using this right away. If you have uh, know of a service that's implementing the OGC tile spec, you can create an OGC map tile source and add that to a tile layer. So here's an example of how you might uh, pull in imagery tiles um, from a web Mercator projection. Then we also have support for the OGC vector tile um, formats. So in this case, you specify uh, what format of tile, this is the map box vector tile format that you want. And assuming this vector tile uh, data source advertises that media type, then we'll pull in that tile set and render them in a vector tile layer. And uh, here's an example of a vector tile layer. The benefits of course, are that you get this interactivity and uh, dynamic styling like Andreas was just showing. Uh, and we have to admit that this example is actually not using the OGC tile spec because just before the presentation, the service that we were using for this uh, went down. So we switched to just a, uh, another existing geo server that we're pulling vector tiles from. But you'll have to believe us that we do support the OGC uh, tile spec, both the, the map and the uh, vector variety. Uh, okay, so back to Andreas for some more exciting uh, rendering with WebGL. This is uh, rendering uh, WebGL points from vector data, an experimental feature that has become uh, more popular also uh, with something that Tim is going to show next as the next surprise. Um, we can not only uh, render symbols with a fixed uh, size or with literals, we can also do attribute math with uh, an expression language that's similar to the one used in uh, Mapbox styles. So uh, we're, we'll be looking at a data set uh, of meteorites here. Um, th those have a mass attribute, so we can calculate the size based on the mass. Uh, those meteorite impacts also have their impact year as attribute, so we can get the year and change the opacity, show uh, recent impacts with a uh, higher opacity than ones that are long, long ago. We can also apply filters to the data set. So let's say we want to show only filters from a certain period of 10 years within the time frame that we have. Uh, and 10 years back from the current year, then we can use this between filter, for example. And if we put these pieces together and make an animation with it, then we get a meteorite sh shower that shows a meteorite impacts and the size and the opacity decreases. And after 10 years, the impact has disappeared to show the new ones that are more recent. Back to Tim for something that should look familiar now. All right, so Andres showed off how these style expressions can be used to render vector data. And we now have support for doing the same with raster data. So I showed previously the, the GeoTIFF source. Those are based on these raster data tiles. And when you add those to a WebGL tile layer, you can run expressions on that before they're rendered. So in this case, I want to, let's say, get the, the red band. So I make an expression for that and the near infrared band. And then I want to take the difference between those two and the sum. And then finally, the ratio of uh, that difference and sum. And that is the normalized difference vegetation index. Uh, then I can 
create a color that interpolates that normalized difference vegetation index between negative one and one in this case. And this would show a grayish value at negative one and a dark green at positive one. Um, we can, of course, pick more stops in that color ramp and more exciting colors. And that's what this example does here. So this is showing uh, two bands of data from a Sentinel image and then doing band math on the fly to calculate this NDVI value and then applying this dynamic style ramp. Um, so we get a nice coloring of uh, healthy vegetation in dark green and unvegetated areas in other colors. Uh, another feature of the WebGL tile layer render is that you can get variables from your application and have them be evaluated in your style. So I might want to have sea level be an application set variable. I want to let the user choose sea level. And then I want to say when, sea, when the elevation is below sea level, I use a case expression. I'm going to color it uh, blue. And when the, the elevation is above sea level, I'll make it transparent. So there's zero and alpha here. And then when the user changes a slider value, I'm going to update the style variables. So I'm updating the sea level. And that's what this example does. It lets the user update the, um, the sea level. And then it's rendering an elevation data set with that style expression that we just showed you. So values below sea level are blue and above sea level um, are transparent. And then uh, back to Andreas to wrap it up, uh, talking a little bit about the developer experience. And um, I'll give it to Andreas. Yeah, so uh, open layers uh, is uh, JS doc type. So all the types for all functions and classes are specified using the JS doc syntax. And this makes for a nice user experience when working with the modern IDE like Visual Studio, Studio Code. Um, as you can see here in this demo, um, as you hover over things, you get the documentation directly out of the type descriptions. Uh, it's also type aware. So when you start using a, an event function, it knows which events are available. So as soon as you start typing the event type, you see the available types. And this is really a nice developer experience that you can benefit from. Also for type checking, if you are a TypeScript user, this can also be done with these types that we ship in our package. Now, um, I want to thank um, the German company Terrestris, who recently uh, sponsored my efforts on, on GitHub. Uh, so I was able to create the 6.7 release. Uh, we also thank our sponsors uh, for the project. Um, if you like what you see here, or if you've been a user for, of Open Layers, you might consider sponsoring it as well. There are two ways of sponsoring the project. Uh, one way is project sponsoring, that these funds go into community gatherings, uh, code springs, where we advance the library and set up the roadmap. Or you can sponsor individual developers like me. Um, and in this case, the funds are used for maintaining the library review pull requests um, and do things that otherwise uh, don't happen. And in my case, same for other libraries like Proj4 or, or Mapbox type. Thanks everyone for their att attention and enjoy the rest of the Phosphor-G conference. We do have, a, thank you so much, Andreas and Tim. That was great. And um worked really seamlessly. We have a few questions and not much time, so I'm just going to get right to it. Um, the uh, We have a question that's really in two parts here. I've tried it with React and TypeScript, but it could not find the specific packages when doing import as seen on examples on the web page. Import as OL control from OL control. Do you know of this and or the solution? So I'll try to answer this. Um, in uh, editors like Visual Studio Code, most of these imports are auto-detected and will be inserted automatically. This does not always uh, work seamlessly, um, but you can always look these imports up in the API doc. So if you go to the Open Layers website, uh, openlayers.org, um, uh, choose the API documentation and uh, then search for what you want to use. For example, if you are looking for the correct import for OL view, just type in view in the search. And the first thing it will show you at the top of the view page is uh, the import you'll need to make use of that. Cool. One more question here. Another is, 
how well does open layers work within a react web app application is there a react version of open layers and if so how does it differ and if there is not or if there's not a react version is there open layer support for pg tile serve uh i'll take that one yeah that uh, we use open layers and react react together quite extensively and in some cases i've used a wrapper library um, I think it's public, but Planet Labs has a library um, called OL or called Layers. I'll confirm actually that's public. But even if it's not, um, the idea is that you can you can wrap uh, wrap things like open layers, layers, and maps in React components and have them work well together. You just want don't want all of the state transitions to go through React as you're animating the view. For example, you don't want React to necessarily have to know about the center at every frame. And then PG tile serve, um, I think the answer should be yes, but I don't have experience using it. Andreas, do you know for PG tile serve or? Um, I haven't serve? used it either, but uh, the way we can configure loaders and use different formats should allow you to get this done with some custom loaders and maybe uh, some tweaks to an existing uh, format. Uh, I've used uh, strange formats for uh, vector layers, raster layers, and vector tile layers and never run in, ran into limitations. Cool. Well, there's a couple more questions, but we're really out of time. Tim and Andreas, if you have...